Good morning, and welcome to Easter online with the Highland Baptist family of churches. Due to this season of COVID-19, we are not able to be gathered anywhere, but we are still the church, and this is still Easter Sunday. So with the amazing gift of technology, we have gathered to worship our risen Savior. You know, early this morning, as I sat in my study and heard the storm roll in, I confess I found myself giving in to the mood of the moment. For the first time in my life, I won't be worshiping with my church family on Easter Sunday. And then it's going to, on top of that, it's going to be a dark and stormy day. But then the Holy Spirit of God reminded me that not even COVID-19 or a stormy day can stop the worship of the church because Jesus is alive and that is enough for us. So whether you're a member of the Highland family from either of our campuses or you're a guest with us this morning, welcome to this celebration of our risen Savior. This online worship service is not a background video. So be prepared. Get your family together. Make sure you got your Bible in your hand and a heart that's ready to worship and let's celebrate together today. Give attention to the Word of God, and let's respond to what He says to us as we celebrate the resurrection of His Son and our Savior, Jesus. Thank you for joining us. Let's worship together. Good morning, everybody. Lift up our voices and praise the One who made a way that we could be saved. He is worthy of praise. my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my Savior on that cursed tree his body
the dearest and best for a world of lost sinner was slain. So I cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I Yeah. 
life is worth the living just because our Savior lives.
that is the God that we serve today. Would you join me as we pray? Father, we thank you that we can come and gather in this way, in this place, and we can be reminded of how amazing it is that you took our place on the cross, that you gave your life to pay for our sin, and then you triumphed over our great enemy once and for all through your glorious resurrection. We look forward to that day when we will see you face to face. Thank you for Easter Sunday. Thank you for this resurrection celebration. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let me invite you this morning, if you will, to open your Bibles to Psalm 22. And as you're turning there, let me just remind you that several Sundays ago, right before we had to head into this online-only season of church, I shared with you a message from this passage in Psalm 22 about the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus. Today, we want to finish this by looking specifically at the last half of this psalm. And so if you've got your Bible open to Psalm 22, and I hope you do, we'll begin to read together in verse 22. Read this along with me, will you? I will tell of your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him. All you descendants of Israel. For he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, nor has he hidden his face from him. But when he cried to him for help, he heard, From you comes my praise in the great assembly. I shall pay my vows before those who fear him. The afflicted will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him will praise the Lord. Let your heart live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will worship before you. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth will eat and worship. All those who go down to the dust will bow before him, even he who cannot keep his soul alive. Posterity will serve him. It will be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They will come and will declare his righteousness to a people who will be born, that he has performed it. In this psalm, we read words written by David, Israel's second king, and the author of many of the 150 psalms that we find in this book. In the first 21 verses of this psalm, David describes things he has never seen. He has never experienced himself. But he wrote in great detail about the cross of the Lord Jesus, about what happened to Christ when he was hung on that cross for us. It's as if he is describing the horrors of the crucifixion through the eyes of Jesus himself. You can go back and read those first 21 verses later. But that's what David describes. And we believe he was writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit prophetically about the day that Christ would die for us. This psalm begins, if you look back at the very beginning of it, it begins with the haunting cry of Jesus from the cross. My God, my God, he said, why have you forsaken me? Then the psalm moves back and forth between graphic descriptions of the suffering he endured and statements of his confident trust in the very God who seems to have abandoned him. In verses 19, 20, and the beginning of verse 21, Jesus cries out for deliverance one last time as death closes in. But then in the last part of verse 21, something remarkable happens. It is as if Jesus has received a word from the Father, assuring him that even now, none of this is out of his control. He finishes that verse with what he believes God has done. Look at the end of verse 21. He said, from the horns of the wild oxen, you answer me. Just a few verses earlier, it describes those who gathered around him to crucify him as wild bulls. He picks that up again and says, you have delivered me. With that final word of assurance, 
there is silence. No more descriptions of suffering. No more cries for help. Just silence. Jesus, the Messiah, has died. And after he died, Joseph of Arimathea, one of the religious leaders of the day, along with Nicodemus, who first came to Jesus by night in John chapter 3, asked for and were granted the body of the Lord Jesus. They took his body down off that cross, and they wrapped it, and they laid it in a borrowed tomb. And those who loved the Lord Jesus and had just watched him die went home. And I suspect they spent a very long, very sleepless night. And I suspect the next day on the Sabbath, while everything in the city of Jerusalem was quiet, they spent that day almost silently reflecting on what had happened and thinking about the meaning of what they had experienced. Not just of Jesus' death, but of everything they had experienced throughout those three years they had walked with him and talked with him. And they found themselves questioning whether any of what they had experienced was real. You know, sometimes we, in our own lives, find ourselves in places just like that, dealing with the unexpected silence of God. Dealing with the unexpected silence of God. Sometimes we pray and cry out to God, and and we are left with no choice but to trust that he hears us even when it seems like he has not heard us. And we face those moments knowing that his timing is perfect, that he is a sovereign God, and that he sometimes has answers we cannot even begin to imagine. So let me give you a statement, and I hope you'll write this down, and my prayer is that the Holy Spirit of God will write this in your heart. Never mistake the silence of God for the inactivity of God. Never, ever, as a follower of Christ, ever mistake the silence of God for the inactivity of God. Even though you might not hear him, even though you might not be able to see what he is doing, we serve a sovereign God who is always at work. Never mistake the silence of God for the inactivity of God. And let me just give you one of the greatest lessons God has ever taught me. Please write this statement down. When God is suddenly silent, lean in. Because he may be about to say or do something you don't want to miss. Anytime you're faced with a sudden silence of God, lean in. Lean in. He's getting ready to do something. He's getting ready to say something. When God is silent, lean in because he might be about to say or do something you really don't want to miss. And so Jesus has died. And it got quiet. But then in verse 22 where we began reading a minute ago, everything changes. It's as if the psalm begins again, but this time it is no longer in a minor key. Defeat has given way to victory. Death has been defeated by life. As the crucifixion of Jesus on Friday has given way to the resurrection of Jesus on Sunday. We've all heard the old saying, it's Friday, but Sunday is coming And we are so grateful for that. And that's what we find right here from verse 21 to verse 22 of this psalm. It was Friday in verse 21. It is Sunday in verse 22. And in this passage of Scripture, in this chapter, it tells us that because Christ is alive, two things are going to happen. Two things are going to happen because Christ is alive. First of all, notice with me that because Christ is alive, he will be praised in the church. He will be praised in the church. Beginning in verse 22, we read about what Jesus did as soon as he arose. He went to declare the greatness of God to the people he referred to as his brethren. In fact, this morning I read through the resurrection morning accounts of all four of the Gospels and how they explained that to us. 
And I hope you've taken some time to do that as well. But in Matthew's account of that, listen to what Jesus said to the women who were first to the tomb on that resurrection morning. Matthew 28 verse 10 said, Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Go and take word to my brethren and leave, uh, uh, my brethren, to leave for Galilee, and there they will see me. From that moment on, listen, from that moment on, Jesus has been gathering around him a group of people that he calls my brethren. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 2, the writer quotes this verse from Psalm 22, and he says that Christ is not ashamed to call them brethren. Aren't you grateful that he is willing to call us his brothers? David wrote Psalm 22 a thousand years before the church was born. But he writes about it in this verse as he describes the resurrected Lord Jesus going into a gathered assembly of the people of God. When they translated the Old Testament into the Greek language, they translated this well, the words of Jesus in this verse by saying that he was in the midst of the great church. He was going to praise God, his Father, in the midst of the great church. And interestingly enough, it, it reveals Jesus to us here as the leader of our worship. Have you ever thought about that when the church comes together, whether we're in this room and we're worshiping together physically or we're gathered together online? Either way, when the church is together worshiping, Jesus is our worship leader. He is our great teacher. Those of us that he has given the task of leading the church in worship or preaching the gospel to the church, we are just echoes of his voice. He is the worship leader in the church. And then in verse 23, he calls us to join him. And he gives us three expressions to our worship. We are to praise him, he said. We are to glorify him. And we are to stand in awe of him. But then he tells us in verse 24 why we are to worship him. First of all, notice this. We worship because God raised him from the grave in verse 24. Justice demanded that Jesus die as our substitute, that he carry the burden of our sin to Calvary, that he endure the wrath of God for us. That was what the justice of God demanded, that our sin be paid for. But the father never quit loving his son. The father never quit loving his son, even though he turned his face away from him on the cross. Listen, he did not keep his face hidden. The Father answered his prayer for deliverance and raised him from the dead. He had prayed and cried from the cross for God to deliver him from that suffering. And God chose not to deliver him from that suffering, but he did deliver him from that sepulcher. He did deliver him from that grave. We serve a God who has raised his son to life. This morning, that's why we celebrate. That's why we sing. That's why we rejoice, because God has raised his son to life. In fact, the Bible tells us that, that God declared him to be the son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. For some reason, this last few days, I've been just listening to old music, old gospel music for some reason. I don't know if I'm just feeling old or what, but I've been listening to some of that. And a, and a group called New Song years ago did a song called, uh, called uh, Arise, My Love, one of the great Easter songs where it, it talks about how God reached down into that grave and, and he, he called his son out. He, he told him to arise, my love. And that's the God we serve, and he raised our Savior to life. We worship because of that. Secondly, we worship because of that is the fruit of his life in us. In verse 25, it's a complicated verse to try to translate and interpret, but Jesus ultimately refers to paying his vows in that verse, which was probably a reference back to the thanksgiving offerings and sacrifice prescribed by the Old Testament law. Our worship is worship paid by our, or, or, or uh, our worship is worship that has been paid for by our Savior himself. Our praises are the fruit of of his vows. He has promised worship from his church. In other words, let me see if I can help you understand this. In other words, our worship is just the Jesus that now lives in us 
offering praise to the Father. Church, listen to me this morning. We worship because Christ lives in us, because he's alive and he lives in us. And it's his life that cries out in worship to the Father from us. And so we are to worship him because that's the fruit of his life in us. But finally, watch this. We worship because of what he has done for us. We are afflicted people. The Bible tells us here we're afflicted people. But notice what the scripture teaches us right here. It teaches us that he has invited those who are afflicted, and he's invited them to his table, to to feast at his table. In Psalm 23, it tells us that our shepherd king, (laughs) our shepherd king will prepare a table before us in the presence of our enemies. In Luke chapter 13, Jesus was talking to the religious leaders of his day who thought they would get into the kingdom of God because of who they were. They thought they were part of an elite crowd who would be saved. Jesus told them this. He said, and they will come from east and west and from north and south and they will recline at the table in the kingdom of God. Ladies and gentlemen, do you understand that our great Savior died to take away our sin on the cross so that we might have a personal relationship with God and he invites us to his banquet table where he has prepared the best of his blessings for us because he is alive. That's who we are and we worship because of what he has done for us. That last line of verse 26, if you'll look at that, says, let your heart live forever. In other words, our joy over what he has done for us, watch this, will never end. Our joy over what he has done for us will never end. Let me give you a simple statement. Hope you'll write this down. The resurrected Christ satisfies us with good things today and promises us a place at his banquet table one day in glory where we, his brethren, his church, the ransomed people of God will praise him forever. Church, this is not just something we're going to do today. But the Bible tells us because Christ is alive, we enjoy his banquet table today. And one day we will worship him in heaven for all of eternity. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains lose all their guilty stains lose all their guilty stains and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains ere since by faith i saw the stream thy flowing wounds supply redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till i die and shall be till i die and shall be till i die redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till i die and this poor Lisping, stammering tongue Lies silent in the grave Then in a nobler, sweetest song I'll sing thy power 
power to save. I'll sing thy power to save. I'll sing thy power to save. Then in a nobler, sweeter song, I'll sing thy power to save. And that is our story, church, because Christ is alive. He has made redemption through his blood, the theme of our song, and we will sing it until we die. And then when he calls us home to heaven, he will give us a nobler, sweeter song, and we will sing that same song of praise for all of eternity. Man, I wish you were here right now to say amen. But secondly, notice the second thing that we learn from this passage about what happens because Christ is alive. First of all, he's praised in the church. But secondly, he is preached to the nations. Beginning in verse 27 and going down through verse 31, we read where he is preached to the nations. Beginning in verse 27, we find out that our Messiah, our Savior Jesus, has a missionary spirit. Look at verse 27. He said, all the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will worship before you. In fact, he, he says that for emphasis twice. He, he mentions it twice. He said, they will remember and turn to the Lord. And he said, they will worship before you. All of the nations of the earth will worship before you. In verse 28, he describes the Lord's reign over all nations. Again, he repeats it for emphasis. Look at that verse in verse 28. He said the kingdom is the Lord's and he rules over the nations. And so in those verses, the Lord is describing two things. Look at these things with me. First of all, he is describing the coming dominion of the Lord. He has already told us who will praise him. Notice what he said. Just let your eyes wander back up to verse 23 and walk all the way back down here with me. He has told us that those who fear the Lord, in verse 23, will praise him. In verse 23, he also told us all the descendants of Jacob will glorify him. And then in verse 23, he said all the descendants of Israel will stand in awe of him. He told us, in verse 26, that the afflicted will eat and be satisfied, and those who seek the Lord, according to verse 26, will praise him. Now, he tells us, in verse 27, that all the nations will worship before him, and just in case there is any doubt, he tells us, in verse 29, that the prosperous will eat and be satisfied, just like the afflicted. In verse 29, he tells us the lowly in the dust of the earth will worship him. And those who have died, in verse 29, will bow before him. Listen to how Isaiah describes the coming glory of the Lord. He said, they will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. I'm just telling you, church, I'm so excited that today we stand here in all of the confusion and the doubt about what's going on in our land and and literally in our world because of this virus, and and we don't know what the future holds, and and I'm just telling you, we're standing here in this moment, but what I am telling you is that whatever happens is just an interlude between here and glory, because one day the glory of God is going to cover the earth as waters cover the sea, and and, and this is going to be his domain. I'm just so excited about the day when the Lord Jesus covers this old earth in the glory of God, aren't you i mean that's where we are church we don't know what's going to happen but bless god we know who holds our future and we know that one day the whole world every nation of the world every ruler every tribe every tongue every people and every nation is going to bow before him in worship he describes here the coming dominion of the lord everybody will worship him 
But then notice the second thing. In verses 30 and 31, the Lord Jesus tells us about the current mission of the church. He says, because Christ is alive, we have a mission. He describes us as a seed. The New American Standard that I read from a minute ago, and if you're reading from the ESV translation, both of them use the word posterity. But when we consider what the Lord says right here in Psalms in light of the New Testament revelation, the word seed actually seems like a better translation. This time of year, many of you who have a green thumb, you're planting flowers or you're planting vegetables and you're planting seeds in the ground. I remember, I was telling somebody this the other day, I remember when my grandfathers were alive, every year about this time they would say they're not going to plant a garden this year, they got too much stuff left in the freezer. And every year, like clockwork, they would go out and plant seeds in the ground that would grow. Seeds are small things which grow into much bigger things. And so right here, he calls us a seed, church. He said, we're a seed. That's one of the illustrations the Lord Jesus used in Matthew's gospel to describe his kingdom. Listen to what he said in Matthew 13. He said, he put another parable before them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a grain of a mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds. But when it is grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. It's a great picture of the coming kingdom of God. Because you see, Jesus, when he was here, chose 12 men to be his disciples. And when he went back to heaven, a group of his followers gathered in an upper room, and the Bible tells us there were 120 of them. And they were told to go back to that upper room and await the coming of the Holy Spirit in his fullness, and they did. And those 120 people were in that room praying together and seeking God until the Holy Spirit of God came down. And when he came, Peter stood up and he preached on the day of Pentecost, and 3,000 People were saved, gave their lives to Jesus, were brought into the fellowship of the church. Now, I don't know if you're keeping up or not, but he started with 12, and then there were 120, and then on the day of Pentecost, there were 3,000. And by the time you get to Acts chapter 4, there are now 5,000 coming to Christ. And so over time, that mustard seed has begun to grow and begun to look more like the tree that Jesus described as posterity. That seed has told each coming generation about the Lord. This morning, we're here on Easter Sunday, and even though many of our extended family celebrations have, have been cut off this year because of the coronavirus, most of us on a day like this, we think about family members and we think about people who taught us to worship the Lord. But moms and dads and grandparents who dressed us for Easter Sunday and took us to worship with the people of God in the church. More importantly, they lived a Christian life in front of us and they taught us to love and follow Jesus. That seed has been reproducing and creating this tree and all the birds are coming and finding their place to rest in this tree. And, and the, the simple truth is that's the kingdom of God. And the, the, the seed is telling each successive generation about the Lord. In verse 31, we read how generations of the church will tell the next generation who have not even been born yet about the Lord. This morning, we have some young families watching us, and you've got young children. You maybe even have a baby in your home. You have very small ones in your home, and God has given them to you, and he's given you the blessed privilege of teaching them about the things of God, of gathering them around you while you're watching the people of God in worship and teaching them about how much Jesus loves them. And some of you are still waiting that day when God God blesses your family with children, and when he does, you're going to pour the things of God into them, and you're going to teach them the way the previous generation taught you, because that, those are the things of God that will last, and you're going to pour that into your kids, and that seed is going to continue telling the coming generations about the Lord, and one day, 
And one day the plan God designed before the foundation of the world will be fulfilled. We read about when that day comes in the book of Revelation, if you can get there quickly enough. Go with me to the book of Revelation chapter 7. In Revelation chapter 7, I want you to read with me beginning in verse 9. Listen to what John said. He said, After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one could count from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and palm branches were in their hands. And they cry out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures and they fell on their faces before the throne and they worshiped God saying amen blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever amen then one of the elders answered saying to me these who are clothed in the white robes who are they and where have they come from? And I said to him, My Lord, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones who have come out of the great tribulation, and they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason they are before the throne of God, and they serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will spread his tabernacle over them. They will hunger no more, nor thirst any more, nor will the sun beat down on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb in the center of the throne will be their shepherd and will guide them to springs of the water of life. And God will wipe every tear from their eyes. Now, I don't know if you're keeping up. I don't know if you've been tracking with the math, but Jesus started with 12. And then there were 120 in that upper room. And then there were 3,000 on the day of Pentecost. And then in Acts chapter 4, there were 4,000. And from generation to generation, the church has carried the gospel of Jesus Christ so that people from every Every succeeding generation can come to know Christ and we have preached the gospel to the nations not to the degree that we should have because we need to be more faithful in that no matter how faithful we are we need to be faithful in preaching the gospel to people who are who are like us and who are different who are close to us and who are far away we've been called to preach the gospel and the church has been proclaiming that gospel and passing the faith of this resurrected Christ along from generation to generation knowing that one day there's going to be this massive multitude that no one can count and they're going to come from every tribe and tongue and people and nation on the planet and they're going to worship the living God who alone is worthy of our praise that's what's going to happen church we are engaged in that great mission right now that is who we are that's going to happen we're going to see that we're going to see that because God has made that his purpose and he has promised to fulfill that purpose through his church and as each generation takes up the mission of the Messiah and preaches the gospel from one generation to the next, we see the kingdom of God growing in its fullness. At the last phrase of Psalm 22, in the last phrase of verse 31 of this psalm, tells us exactly the truth we proclaim. This is the truth we preach to the nation's church. Notice what he said. He has performed it he has performed it do you remember what jesus said from the cross when he died he said one word in the original language to tell us we translate it into three words it is finished do you realize that when jesus died on the cross we were people who needed to be rescued from our sin. We are sinners, and we have separated ourselves from our holy God because of our sin. And we deserve death and hell. We deserve the absolute wrath of God. But God loved us too much to leave us in that condition and not provide for our salvation. So he sent his son. He sent Jesus, our Savior, perfect, holy, sinless, lived his whole life without sin so he could be our sacrifice. 
The Bible says God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. That means he took all of your sin and all of my sin and he placed them on the sinless account of Jesus. And Jesus stood guilty before the Father, not because of your sin, about because of his sin, but because of yours and mine. He died in our place as our substitute on the cross. And just before he died, he said, it is finished. Not, I'm finished, I'm about to die, I've done all I can do. He said, no, it is finished. I have fulfilled the plan of the Father. And this morning I can stand here and tell you that if you do not know Christ as your Savior and Lord, if you don't have a personal relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ, you can, not because of who you are or who we are, not because of your name or because of our denomination, not because of anything we could do for ourselves or for each other. We have that hope. We can have salvation this morning because he has performed it. Because Jesus has done everything for us on his death and resurrection that is necessary for our salvation. And he simply tells us that if we will receive by faith everything he has already done for us, that he will save us and give us eternal life. And church, that's our testimony. This week, many of our people have been putting out on social media wonderful little minute and a half or two minute redemption story videos. Simply telling people how Jesus saved them. Could you do that this morning? Do you know for certain that you have eternal life and you're going to go to heaven when you die? The Bible simply tells us that if you'll turn from your sin, we call it repentance, and you place your trust in Christ alone, you can be saved and we invite you to do that this morning. But as the church of the living God this morning, we understand he's our Savior, and we worship him because of what he did for us on the cross. We worship him because he's alive, and every day of our life, we spend our lives proclaiming that message that Jesus has performed it. And that gets us up in the morning, and that's why we gather, and that's why we are, some of us, so desperate to gather together again now. And that's why when we walk out those doors, we enter our mission field, and we spend our life telling people about this wonderful Savior named Jesus. Listen to what Paul said. Listen to what Paul said in 1 Timothy. He said, by common confession, great is the mystery of godliness. He who was revealed in the flesh, was vindicated in the spirit, was seen by angels, was proclaimed among the nations, and believed on in the world, and taken up in glory. That is our confession this morning. We have a living Savior. Would you bow with me, please? Right where you are, would you bow your heads and close your eyes? And this morning, if you have never entered into a personal relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ, if you, right where you are, right there in your den, your living room, whether you're watching on a computer screen or or on television, right there where you are, you can turn from your sin and place your trust in Christ alone. You don't have to be here. You don't have to be with us. All you need to know is that God is there, that our Savior is alive, and that he hears you when you pray. You have to know that he is the...